This is Creativity Drill with Dr. Don and Jonathan Rundman. Hey everybody, this is Jonathan, and today's episode features Ben Kelly, who is somebody that Don and myself did not know at all until he showed up at our house and sat down at the table. So you'll hear us meeting him as you meet him in this conversation, which we know you will enjoy. All right, we can do it for real. You ready? Ready. ready. Here. Cheers. Here's to you. Here's to you guys. Okay, so you were you were telling us you're from Ham Lake. Ham Lake. Holy cow. How did, yeah. how did that happen? Yeah, so what happened is two lovely people got married and had children. I am one of those children. Huh? And then they were so gracious to let me continue living in their house. Okay. On and off since I've been alive. Okay. So that's just a real fancy way of saying I still live at my folks' place. It's your hometown though. Yeah, and basically um, it goes Twin Cities and then you go north above that and you get into like the Brooklyn Park, Brooklyn Center. You go north above that, you get into Fridley, you go north above that, you get to Blaine. And then okay. above that... Oh, sure. It's Ham like four, Fourth Ring Suburb. Fourth Ring Suburb, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm an authentic suburban boy. All right. And we actually grew up in Andover, which is right next to it, which is exactly the same. Okay. And they very, we actually, our address says Ham Lake... But it also is Andover sometimes. So it's just grids of houses and churches yeah. and things like that. And it's very simple. And as um, yeah. soon as I was able to drive, I just came to the city all the time. My parents have always worked in the city. and so. Oh, but I've never, I've never lived with the concept of separated Minneapolis or St. Paul. It's always just been the city to me. Yeah, like and, one metro area. Yeah, and so I consistently, as I'm interacting with artists and people and when I'm working on projects... They go, is it in Minneapolis or St. Paul? I'm like, why does it, why does it matter? Exactly. Like, and because I've always had a car and I've always had to, it's at least 20 miles to get to either. Right. You know what right. I mean? So it's just exciting to be in the city. You know what I mean? Sure. It's like, to me, it's like, well, is it either the Twin Cities or Chicago or something? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. that's a separation to me. And, yeah, I, I think yeah. of it exactly the same way because we're not from here. Mm. We're from Upper Michigan mm-hmm. and we moved here like when? 13 years ago. 13 years. Yeah. yeah. And I don't have any separation between St. Paul and Minneapolis. But but people have very strong they opinions. Do. Like real locals, they do have like yeah, sports passionate. team arguments. Really, like like yeah. oh Minneapolis represent yeah or St. Paul represent. It's like well, it's really kind of it's very similar, you know. And I mean, can we just be like Minnesota represent? <laughs> it's you know, but I there are differences, of course. But it just seems like. I actually had an issue. Somebody didn't want to, for a rehearsal, go to St. Paul. And I know a lot of people are on bikes. Oh, okay. I'm also like, well, if you're on a bike, like all the money you're saving, you know, just put the work in, bike, bike to where the rehearsal is, kind yeah. of a thing. That's how I feel. Yeah. Like, but whatever. <laughs> whatever. I, I, I celebrate all the cities and all the ones in between. You yeah. Know? Yes. I feel like I've, I have a theory that it, it's a... It could sound a bit jaded or a bit biased, but real, quote unquote, real artists live in the suburbs. With, because <laughs> All right, I like this. Because that's where you can get sort of cheap and or affordable rent. I mean, it's really exciting to live in the cities, but everyone wants to live in the cities, so rent and apartments are harder to find. Maybe I just haven't looked enough, whatever. I know there's all those deals out there. Everyone's going to be like, well, on my situation, whatever. There's... So much housing everywhere else because yeah. people own houses and you get a room and then or parents or people's parents and things like that. Sure. And so because I try and make money doing my art, I often fail at that as we all learn and fail and grow. So I've I've had many apartments and then I just moved back to my folks' place and then apartments and back to my folks' place and so it's so sort of an on and off thing. You're describing the opposite of what happened like in New York in the eighties or the seventies. Yeah. Because in New those are the days when artists would move to the urban center right. because it was crime infested and exactly. cheap and exactly. you could get a bunch of artists living in a flop house together mm-hmm. and then you get the talking heads and blondie and all that stuff happening. Right, right. And, and then, you know, and then you might uh, afford to move out to the burbs. But now you're, you're describing the opposite where musicians and artists and people like that have to move to the burbs. Yeah, exactly. To keep the, to, to continue to make their art as their vocation. Absolutely. And then just the heavy hitters in finance or whatever are living in Uptown yeah. or living in the warehouse district exactly. in Minneapolis. Isn't that weird? Well, and it is. And there's the term artist lofts or art space or whatever. And it's really... I, is I have that a, hard, a misnomer? It is because what happens <laughs> is by using the term artist, because housing can somehow be 
operated under Section Eight or like a system, or not a, uh, like Section Eight or like a different living situation. Like it's a different tax break. Yeah. What that means is property tax is less for a lot of these large companies. I didn't so, know that. So they'll throw, and I don't know the financials of it exactly, yeah, but yeah. Uh, I think it's a lot better deal for a company to open up an artist loft, and then it looks really good. It's like when you put organic on fruit that's not organic. Yeah, you know, like an artist loft, <laughs> uh-huh. and then. I applied to the artist loft and I did all the work and I did all the paperwork and all this stuff and then they were like, oh, great, oh, I'm going to need, uh, like, we're going to need your tax return and then we're going to need three months of paychecks. Uh-huh. And I was like, paychecks? <laughs> I was like, what do you think I do? <laughs> like, what art nine to five is giving you paychecks? Yeah. And it's like, I, I'm an artist. It's an artist loft. Are, so like, are you are you saying that art is your only job? Is that what, is that your I, gig? Well, that's a whole deeper conversation. I, that's what we're here for, Ben. What I, Yes. <laughs> That's why I'm also here. What, what I love to do is my only job. And um, yes, I, that's me being super snobby about terms. But like, yes, art, quote unquote, is my only job. Yeah. Um, of all things, art, production, projects, working sure. with that kind of stuff. But I often consider myself not an artist because I feel like art is the sacred term that's beh- beh- Beheld for the people who do the sheer creating, and oh, then there's yeah. like producer, yeah, or, yeah, so uh, post production and all that and stuff, production, all that kind of thing. But right. I, uh, I, I, I used to have he- real, real heated debates with jazz instructors about what is art. Yeah, and one of my teachers, he was a brilliant saxophone player, and uh, he played with a lot of people. He played with the Temptations and Chuck Berry, and then he taught jazz, and he teaches all over the place. And he was a wonderful guy. And he, um, he was like, I'm not an artist. I was like, yeah, but you, you have all this stuff. He's like, no. He's like, I am an employee of music. That's like completely wow. how he thought of it. Like people ask me to do something and yeah, I'll improvise and I'll help write songs and all that stuff. But uh-huh. like there's artists out there. Those are people that are just, you know, spend all their whole life drinking in a warehouse and splashing paint on canvases. Uh-huh. And he's like, those are artists. He's like, I'm a professional. Wow. I'm, I'm an employee of music. Interesting. Yeah. And, he, and he wasn't dissing himself or, or he didn't have no, any sort he, of regrets he, in that he, state. He held it to high regard. And yeah. He, and do you think it was, it's because of uh, he wasn't suffering? Like, do you think he thought artists need to suffer? I, th- I definitely think that is a part. I don't think that was his thing, but I do believe a lot of people romanticize the suffering right. of, of doing art and really, like, breathing through your work. Right. Which I think is, I think happens, and I think it's silly. Because, ah! <laughs> because I, and I think it's, I think it's silly, but I also think it's quite tragic. Because, yeah, it's like, oh, man... Kurt Cobain, he was this, whoa, he's crazy, you know, all this stuff, and it's like, it's, like, isn't he awesome, you know, this amazing stuff, and it's like, yeah, but he doesn't think he wrote amazing stuff, and then he lived a terrible life, and then it ended tragically, it's like, yeah. that's horrible. Yeah, and he could have done so much more. He could have done so much more, yeah. and, all the, and like, Jackson Pollock made the best paintings, like, yeah, but he hated everything, and he hated himself, and it's like, <laughs> he hated I everything. wouldn't wish that upon anyone, and like, you think that's going to be amazing, but like, if anybody, you know, if anybody with true, like, mental disorders or emotional disorders and is really quite terrible and so it's bizarre that people think like oh you know i'm a troubled writer i'm gonna move into the woods but it's like man those people like that is a like i uh, that sounds terrible that yeah. sounds so scary and yeah. so um <laughs> I, I, to this what you're saying sounds very refreshing to me and i i'm kind of i'm in the boat with you mm. but that's you're saying stuff that people get very angry at. Yeah, I know people in my personal life, and there are probably people listening who are starting to get anxious about you, your language. Yeah, yeah, I, <laughs> and, and I, I deal with this a lot. And I'm uh, you. How do you deal with it a lot? Do you actually are you like out of the closet about this kind of stuff in, no, in not, the art community? Me. I'm being quite transparent on this podcast right now. Are you just um, like that in your life all the time, though, no. or are you trying to deliberately uh, unveil? Where you're at. I think, I think, I think I'm just, it's great, you know? I think I'm super excited to be on a podcast, so I'm just letting it all hang out. Have you ever been on one before? No, but okay. I, I listen to podcasts constantly as I drive from Ham Lake. Yeah. I, I subscribe to... To I'm the a, city. Yeah, to the cities. Um, I, I subscribe to 26 or so podcasts that yeah. I, I listen to regularly about yep. all kinds of things. I just absolutely love it because... When you play music for a living, I like I can't hear music in the car as much because I'm like I'm doing so much of it. It's like yeah. I need a need a. Break I'm exactly and, the same way, and I find that listening to podcasts and listening to artists talk is yeah. so refreshing and inspiring and interesting. And yeah, I'm it, with you. It's so awesome. So and I'm, we're excited to be your first host. 
Because maybe maybe now you'll go on to be on a bunch of other. Oh podcasts. man, totally! I'm gonna be like, man, check out <laughs> Creativity Drill. That's where it all started. That's where the the raw stuff happens. Yeah. Oh um, well, I'm glad you're excited about this. Well, we we want you to, and anybody who's on this show, for Pete's sake, to yeah, let your freak flag fly. You know. Yeah. That's why a podcasts are great because, yeah. like, holy cow, we can get to know you, and. And the listeners should probably – we should fill them in on something interesting. Dawn and I, we've never even seen you before no. until this very moment. No. And our show usually has guests that Dawn and I know, both of us know. Once in a while we have a guest that I know but Dawn doesn't know or that Dawn knows and I don't know. Sure. That's kind of how it's been. Um, with one other guest we had that we didn't know was Charlie McCarran, who you might know from the composer community. He's got uh, – he does this podcast called – um, Composer Quest. Yes, here yes, in Minneapolis, yes. it's a great podcast, and Super he's good. a he's a good guy. And and we didn't know him either. He just came over and walked in and sat down, just like you did. So, yeah. So, listeners, we're meeting Ben, just like you're meeting Ben, unless you know him from from before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, just it's like hi, you're just meeting me, like. Uh, uh. We should have set it up like, oh, hi, I didn't see you come in. I wasn't expecting anyone. We were just doing dishes. And- <laughs> well, please sit down. The, the tape is rolling. Just co- yeah, great. Um, well, so anyway, you're, what you're telling us is you're on a podcast and you're you're gonna you're you're feeling free to express your yeah, opinions about this. It's it's getting laid and I'm just <laughs> I'm in a comfortable kitchen right now. I mean, recording studio. You got some uh, high end lemonade going. <laughs> Super high end lemonade. It's the only way to drink lemonade. I, I don't know the logo. I don't know if I can even say the the company. I'm not. They're not paying me enough to say the company. They're just paying me enough to drink it. Um, but I do. I work with a lot of different people in all kinds of projects and teams, and I am not this honest about my true feelings of things. Not because I'm ashamed or I don't want people to know, but in oftentimes in the in the setting you're in, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. Yeah. And if it would lead to anything remotely emotional or anybody might have a feeling about it, it's just going to derail the project. Yeah. So. I, uh, as a producer and things, you need to, you need to be honest what the project is, but somehow learn to, you know, feed the animals the right food, as it were, with who's ever on the project. Like, basically as a producer, your sole job, your only job is to work with eccentrics. Yeah. You know? Mm -hmm. It's, everyone, if they're truly an artist and if they have so, so much talent... You're asking them to open up and provide you with this amazing talent or acting, singing, painting, whatever it might be. And with that, you can't expect them to also keep just like a super even keel professional attitude. Like if they're opening up, I mean, some people can do that and they're amazing to work with. But like if I'm asking someone to just completely bear it all, it's going to come with all the baggage, Mm -hmm. which is just my job to feel that baggage so that we can get to what the goal is, which is creating. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And... What, per- what percentage of the people that you're working with in your role as a producer and a coordinator are kind of, uh, how should we say, th- these kind of people we're talking about who are like uh, maybe a little bit fragile or maybe uh, who, are, who are really wearing their hearts on their sleeves and are sort of teetering at the brink? I'd say, a realistically, lot? I'd say 100% wow. of everybody in certain ways. Okay. Not every person, like every person's got that part of them where it just hits their ego or just hurts their, their dignity or something if you went to that place and they can tip, you know, yeah. myself included. Yeah. There's those things that if it got to that point, I'd be like, I'm done. I'm yeah. done. I, I don't really know what those are yet. I'm going <laughs> to but, but realistically, it's, it's tough. I'd say most in every kind of way and not in a very endearing way. Like I don't, I don't say this with any sort of... Uh, idea that I work with people who are unprofessional because uh, it's sort of beside the point when you're dealing with creation. You know, it's my job to be professional or it's the engineers or the so on, the blah, 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 blah. And then, you know, you have an actor and they're hired to act. They're not hired to be super friendly, which is terrible because (laughs) you want everyone to be friendly and that is really how you'll work in this business. Yeah. In any business is if you're a good person. Yeah. But, a lot of times, I look at every I look at everything like a producer, and so this person is a bad attitude, but they're a great actor or they're a great singer. I'm not just saying because I've worked with actors specifically, but anyone. And it's like, well, if we like, we need them for the project. We need them. They're the main person, or they're key, or they're doing a great job. 
And it's like, you know what? What I can do is I'm not taking it personally because they're – maybe they're touching something really personal or really deep and it's hard for them to like work it out. And because of it, they're getting real bitey with people. And There's certainly – I mean I, I, I'm still navigating this a lot too because sometimes it's just not worth it and you can't work with people. Mm-hmm. You have to just say like it's done or whatever. Or yeah. it's like – well, And those people, their career is, is limited. It is limited. Like because there are some really talented people out there but they're totally unhinged. It is. And, or they're just mean. Or just toxic, nasty souls. Absolutely. And, and no matter how talented they are, eventually they're just going to run out of gas. Like, and they're, no one's going to call them anymore. Yep. And, and wherever you go, here's the interesting thing. Is, and I, I, you know, my opinions change often. And so I, I, I'm saying a lot of things even right now. It's like, well, do I really <laughs> believe that? And Because I'm constantly contemplating all these same things yeah. all the time. Yeah. But people are... I, People who have a hard time or are hard to work with in periods of life or whatever, or people who you're like, man, I wish someone would just, you just like, I wish people would know that this person's terrible to work with. You don't ever have to worry about that because the system will work. This, mm-hmm. Like, they'll get eaten alive. Yeah. And, like, they'll get swallowed by the business. Yeah. And then they'll never surface again. Like, the system works in that way. It may take a long, long time. Yeah. But the system works. But on the flip side... You'll never, ever, ever be above that. Like, no matter how high up or how many projects you do, you'll always run into situations where you have people that are hard to work with. Yeah. There's that many people, and because this business is so creative, it leaves a lot of weird paths yeah. for people to work all the way up. I mean, you could do the biggest recording session in the world, you know, all the, the Beyonce session, and you know there's some weird producer or whatever guy yeah. on board that somehow made it to that level, and... and you know, you're like, this guy's wrong, right? And it's like, doesn't matter. Yeah. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter who's right or wrong. Like, he's been able to work with everyone else, so you got to figure it out too. You yeah. Know? And yeah. It's, you got to zig when people zag. Mm-hmm. And just, it's like any relationship, you know? And, and it doesn't, like, I mean, I, I think that's the biggest thing. People are like, this is right, this is wrong. Like, this is the right way to handle the session. Mm-hmm. This is the wrong way. This is the right way to record this track. Mm-hmm. The wrong way. And it's not a game. And a lot of people get caught up on the point system, hmm. which I've recently – I've talked a lot with Matt Patrick about who was one of your recent guests and who's the one who connected me. Yeah, he's our common denominator. We should tell the audience too, uh, the listening audience. I, I can think of two people that you and I are one degree of separation apart. One is Matt Patrick. Yes. And he was on our show and he's a good friend of ours and I've collaborated with Matt now for over 10 years on lots of different things, including my recent solo album that Matt produced. And when Matt was on this podcast, you know, just think of all the interesting and creative people Matt knows. And the only person and immediate person that he said was, Ben Kelly has to be on this show. He said that immediately. And I think, wow, of all the people Matt knows, which is like millions, he was like, you're the guy that has to be on the show. So it's, that's, that was great to hear that from Matt. And then the other person we have. It's the imprimatur. The the (laughs) imprimatur. Define that word for me. It's um, it's like when the Catholic Church gives its stamp oh, of approval. Oh, yes. Yeah. So I was doing some wordplay. Uh, yeah. yeah. No, it's good. He puts the mat in imprimatur. Imprimatur. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll work on that next podcast. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then the other person we have in common, that because I didn't know you and I never heard you perform or seen you any of your productions or anything, I just Googled you and then I saw that I think we have Nate Babs in common. Yeah. And, it was, and I don't know Nate super well, but one year ago exactly... I was on tour with Nate. We did like a little four or five day swing down to Illinois and back with Jake Armadale. Right. So yeah. it was this trio where Nate, where Nate was playing the drums. And it was great. And yeah. he was really a fun guy and a great musician. And I heard great things about that tour. We had really a good time. And then, so when I Googled you, I thought, oh, you're playing with Nate Babs and you're a bass player, right? So you're like yeah. rhythm section yeah. holding down the bottom end with, yeah. with Nate on I, what I assume is a variety of... Yeah, projects and I, uh, first off, I'm, I'm impressed that I'm even remotely Googleable. Yeah, well, because your name is like, there's, there's a lot of Ben Kelly. There's a lot. There's a really successful DJ in London who does quite well, and he's yeah. awesome. There's a handful of football players, I believe. <laughs> uh, that sounds like a show. Yeah, just, right. The Ben Kellys. The Ben Kellys. We yeah, all get like, together. And your friend Matt Patrick of music, yeah. musical guys with two first names. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> my, my middle name is James, so it's just three first names. Yeah. And, I don't think, That's but um, Nate and I basically see each other every day. Hmm. We pretty much do everything together all the time. Wow, so you really are rhythm section. Yeah. You're like a Fleetwood, Mick Fleetwood and 
And John McVie. And the other Fleetwood. Of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, on top of... Yeah, and truly our relationship has been so tight-knit, both professionally and personally. Okay, so you, you're, you're and, friends with him, too. Yeah, in, and it's In just, addition to being a colleague. And it's, it's grown so much, and he's one of those people... I mean, yeah, of course, bass players and drummers, they really connect... Uh, because you're in the rhythm section, so you learn to spend a lot of time with each other and learn your ins and outs and things like that. And obviously, as you know, he's such a wonderful guy and a fantastic player. Mm -hmm. And so it's been to the point where uh, there was a couple scenarios where I got somebody reached out to me, a songwriter, like, hey, put out this new record. I did it all on my own, but I'm going to do a release show, so I'd like a live band. And yep. It's like I was given your name. It's like I'd love to see if you're interested in playing bass for it. Yeah. Like, awesome. Like, sounds great. Uh, and I said, hey, great, you know, nice to meet you. Thanks for reaching out. Uh, this sounds awesome. The only way I'm going to do it is if you hire Nate Babs for drums. Oh, sure. And because, you know, maybe the drummer's amazing, but maybe it's their bud who yeah. owns drums. Right. And then that's a, real, that's a real chair that if it's not filled correctly, it can really bring a whole show down. And, right. And, I, I, you know, at the time I was super busy and I was like, man... But even if everybody else sucks, which was not the case, but like if I if Nate and me are on the job, then it's gonna the rhythm section gonna be solid. We're gonna figure out the forms it's exactly. Nice. And I was like, here's you know here's what I'll take for pay, and I'll only do it if you hire Nate for the same deal. Yeah. And he was just like like he was gonna find a drummer next, you know, and he was like, great. Hey, done. let's let's put a little. Let's put a little push pin in this top part of the conversation for our listeners because mm -hmm. someone listening to this show is a singer songwriter, and they need a band for an upcoming show. And I, I, that's my job. I'm a singer songwriter, yep. and I almost always play alone. But sometimes I need to call someone like you or Matt Patrick or whoever. Mm -hmm. And it's been my experience that the greatest thing a solo act like myself could do is to hire a rhythm section that's a package deal. Yeah. And so if, you, if you're going to talk to a drummer, ask the drummer, which bass player would you like me to call? Or if you're mm -hmm. talking to a bass player, ask, which drummer would you like me to call? Because I find that, man, if you can hire those two people as a package deal, you're, you're going to sound great. They're going to be happy to do the, they'll be happy to do the gig. They'll have a friend to hang with at the gig. And they're going to make you sound awesome. It's everybody wins. Yep. If you hire your rhythm section as a unit. Mm -hmm. rather than saying, ah, oh, well, I've got this great drummer and he's my bud from school or whatever, you know, it's just forget it, you know, like <laughs> just forget him. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you've got, you got, you know, you can, you can play with these guys a lot of the times, but if you really want to have a real rhythm section, hire them as a group. And, you know, you think about like in, in rock music, there are rhythm sections that are undeniably great that have played with a lot of, multiple artists you think of those la dudes who played mm -hmm. with jackson brown and mm -hmm. carly simon and mm -hmm. james taylor and what were they called the wrecking crew wrecking or whatever crew, and sure. then there's the the then there's the motown funk rhythm brothers. the funk brothers and then there's the muscle shoals people yep. and the list goes on and on i mean there's a million and then there's fleetwood mac and you know yep. we could talk all day about rhythm sections but um it's the the team element yeah which is being in a band is the exact same as pulling off a heist. Huh. Because that is a scary, dangerous thing. Uh huh. You know, a bunch of people trying to rob a bank. Now, I don't condone this, but it happens. <laughs> and some people are real good at it. Yeah. Just like some people I play with are real good at being in a band. And it's just like the movie Reservoir Dogs. They're all working on this heist, and there's the one guy who was not an insider you yeah. know, that the one main dude who hired everybody knew he was like this is, I wasn't 100% on him and that's what I'm not gonna I'll spoil the ending but it turned it turns messy <laughs> you know and so if you have a heist if you're going on these on I mean someone's gotta drive the van someone's gotta know the, yeah. someone's gotta know like how do you do somebody's gotta be on safes and all that kind of stuff and if you, <laughs> you hire a new guy because you're short a guy and you don't really know and he gets or you're bringing in your brother-in-law just to be in nice your and he gets <laughs> he, he, you know his conscience kicks in he's like I, I think we're doing something wrong I think we should call the cops yeah. so like I'm gonna you know I'm like I'm feeling nervous about this it's like man no we're you know we committed to this and yeah. so basically if you ever need money you can just rob wait no you can be in a band. Yeah. <laughs> Save myself. Well, I'm glad that you feel that way about Nate and that, you know, mm -hmm. and that you guys operate that way. And I think it's, you know, I, I'll just say to the listeners that there's wisdom in this conversation. 
as you think about who you're going to hire. And it's true in the studio, too, mm -hmm. in addition to who you're going to take on the road mm -hmm. or who's going to do a one-off CD release show mm -hmm. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I wanted to ask you about your bass performance degree. Sure. Which I read about when I was preparing for tonight. And um, just ask you, what is it like to go to a college or university and have bass be your, your major? Um, it's awesome if you really like bass. Do you, um, really, do you really like bass? Not as much anymore. <laughs> that makes I should, me a little sad. I should Not like I, there's any part of me that doesn't like it, but more so, basically, I went in as a bass player and I came out as a producer. Huh. Um, and it, so you didn't know that was going to happen. No, that wasn't my plan. Um, but th I feel like um, a lot of people think of me as a as a bass player, which is what I've done for a really, really long time, or really long in my life. You know what I've done for my entire professional career. Um, and I was just I was going to be the guy. I was going to be the jazz guy. I woke up every woke up every morning with the bow on my upright and just jazz charts. And I was just you know wow. I got I got an associate's in bass performance, and then I. Got my bachelor's in bass performance and just every session like crazy, you know. And then I was doing two, 200 up gigs a year. Wow. Just uh, crazy, you know what I mean? I was like, I'm the guy, I'm the guy. And I was just a headhunter for everyone's gig. Wow. And I was like, I'm going to run this town on the bass. Wow. And it's, it's the only thing I thought about. Wow, you know? so you were, you were really driven. And very driven, And yeah. motivated. Yeah, absolutely. And, wow. I, and I very strategically and viciously took everyone's gig that I could. Mm -hmm. in in town and like uh at school all you know you go to school and bass major and it's amazing because you're with this community of all these other people that are just super geeky about bass or mm -hmm. whatever your instrument is and a really nice music school and and so you just everyone's fighting for their gigs and mm -hmm. i was it a competition in the bass player realm like were there 20 people who are really good kind of not not nearly like some of the competition degrees or the competition that sort of underlies some degrees as I've, as I've heard of, but I mean, of course there's that, it's sort of a, it's sort of a beautiful competition mm -hmm. of just people all trying to do the best that they can. Well, and it's my experience as, uh, someone who needs to hire players to do stuff that, um, bass players and drummers are more needed and more valuable. Yeah. It's like no one needs a guitar player. That's mm -hmm. almost like useless really. Uh, but not boy, quite, but, but not not quite, but <laughs> not quite. Saying, but you know what I mean. But boy, bass players are super valuable, and yeah. drummers are super valuable, especially flexible, good, mm -hmm. polite, uh, functioning yeah. ones. So you were thankfully, I mean, working on an instrument that lots of people need. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's that's the, good. Being a bass player or a drummer is the closest you can get to job security in the music industry. Absolutely, you know. And this is more wisdom for you listeners who yeah. are wondering. How you can stay busy in showbiz, yeah. man, for Pete's sake, play the bass and play the drums. Yeah, and, you know, play it well, yeah. own a car, yeah. own your own gear, yeah. don't be a jerk. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, but on top of that, I, so what happened is I just did gigs, gigs, gigs like crazy, did everything, every tour, every session, every free gig, every paid gig, and I played so much bass. And then what happened is I got so Kind of, like, I burned out, but I also was just like, man, like, I love bass, but I, I love so many more things as well. And as I was growing through my career, or, or, or my, my degree, you're taking a lot of classes, especially at, at McNally Smith, which is where I went. You take arranging courses and conducting courses and, like, production courses and just the, the whole scheme of things, you know, and, and really opened my eyes. And the, obviously the, the staff and the faculty was incredible there. And just like, wow, there's so much... In the world, and especially with each year that comes, it's 2015 now, and we're in an industry that evolves quicker than any other industry in the world. Hmm. You know, the creatives are constantly changing. You know yeah. what I mean? They're, they're getting larger every year, but it's just changing so much. And the idea of just being an instrumentalist is pretty dead. Unless you're incredible, or you're somehow grandfathered in in some sort of circle. Mm -hmm. You know, you, if you practice, it doesn't matter how much you practice or how good you get... You're not going to just make a full living for the rest of your life being just a bass player, just a drummer or whatever. It's like you'll get work, but you, you have to be able to be uh, absorb other traits and make yourself useful in other ways. You know what I mean? And mm -hmm. I was – I liked bass, but it, it, whether it, – maybe it was because it wasn't the ch a, ch a challenge as much because I was playing a lot of pop gigs and that's what I really liked, but – 
I wanted to do larger thing. I wanted to create. Yeah. I wanted to produce. Mm-hmm. Did you see some people doing doing that as you were playing bass and saying, wait, I want to do that? Like, did, were there some, not role models, but just like people that you'd meet in the course of doing shows or other types of things where you thought, wait, I want to, I want to try that? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I mean, it, it didn't come all from like, there wasn't other bass players per se doing that or guitarists or whatever, but I would look and my, my mentor in the time was, was Jeffrey Bailey, who hmm. uh, is a fantastic local bass player and he runs a recording studio as well, which isn't like a super outsource, like whoever wants, you know, rent out my studio. It's, he like takes on projects that he wants to, mm-hmm. and then he helps create these records and, and he, he just takes on these projects. And so he's a, he's the, the producer, the engineer, and then he'll play bass on something or whatever. And I was like, man, that's so exciting to be a part of these larger things. Mm-hmm. And so what I did is I was going as a bass player and then at the end of my degree for my senior recital, I had partnered with a filmmaker and him and I co-produced a short film and then I wrote and performed the score uh-huh. for it. And I never had scored anything before and I didn't really know how. I took some of the beginner arranging classes, mm-hmm. but I was like, I kind of get it. I was learning more on how to voice horns and things like that. And and I was like, well, there's, you know, I know there's a lot of those rules of how to arrange and compose. And I didn't really, I was like, I'll learn those later. But like right now I'm just going to try it. Just yeah. going to do it. And mm-hmm. I had a nine piece ensemble. Mm. And we, at my senior recital, and this wasn't part of my, I didn't get any extra credit or any grade for it. It was completely excess to what I want to do. But I, I just really had the urge to do it. And so on a big projector, we had the film play. And then I conducted a live score to it. Wow. And I, thanks to a lot of help of other students and other teachers, like helping me as I was like going through this sort of thing, but no other bass student had done that, mm-hmm. you know. And and then I did a complete bass recital on top of that, wow. so it was like a two part recital. Yeah. And I was like, whatever, I'll play the bass tunes like later. And and so coming out of there, you know, getting different gigs and tours and opportunities, basically my life is. I consider bass really like my gateway drug to like mm-hmm. these these harder things which and and now I've been a part of on top of my own productions, you know, theater projects, films, yeah. scores, art installations, you know, a lot of records and things like that and it's mm-hmm. been you know the idea of the work I put in or the work that we put in as a team lives on longer than just this one show or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, there's a lot of beauty in the idea of one night is special for the people who are in that room. Yeah. You know, but for all that work you put in on a record, you hope that so many people can hear it and you can reach people for years and years to come. You mm-hmm. know, like Fleetwood Mac, like how many people has rumors touched? Yeah. You know, and yeah. like who, whether they were thinking that or not, all that work they put in is inter- eternalized with this record. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. And it's become something so much larger than just people playing some music together. Mm-hmm. You know, and just like, so are you saying that you're valuing uh, the long-term document, like an album, and the live performance for the people there in the room in that moment? Or are you saying that you're liking one better than the other? No, I, I, think, I think what I'm saying is that I, I have a fascination with the, all the moving parts and all the potential people it can reach, and in all the facets. Like, theater people don't really care about my original record per se mm-hmm. they're like oh I think it's cool but like I you know as a, as a person who absorbs culture or entertainment I want to see theater or people who love to watch films mm-hmm. it's like well I play bass in a band like cool I don't really care about your band yeah you know and so and for me I mean I can think of the records that changed my life but I can also think of the films that changed my life yeah you know that it's like wow and the actors or the roles or the stories or the books or anything you know what I mean mm-hmm. and I my brain really started to move and adapt like a producer. Yeah. And I, I've coined the term entre producer. <laughs> yeah. Which is then, that's what you do is you produce and then I've started all these kind of like little companies or these shows where I've, you know, you, you're like, I'm going to do a variety show. It's like, great, what does that mean? It's like, great, I guess we need a bunch of money and a space and actors and scripts and insurance and a theater and then shows and then audience and then marketing and then we need content, blah, 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 and online a website and just all the things that went with it. But the problem solving and just the idea of pooling 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 people together to make this one thing great, it's, 
That's what's fascinating to me. Yeah. When you think about your the future of your ongoing career, do you are you more passionate about any of those directions coming up? Like you want to be more theater shows, more studio work, more yeah. playing in the band, or more composing, or or do you just want to always be able to do everything? I I mean, I always want to do everything, mm-hmm. and I know I can't, yeah. and that secretly just kills me that I can't be the best at everything I try. You know? Yeah. Because you know, I think people there's something to be said about the people who just do their one thing really, really well. You yeah. know, and they do, they do that well. But I think people can, I think human beings are capable of doing a handful of things very well. Sure. Uh, and especially all under an umbrella of something like creatives or whatever. It's mm-hmm. like, I'm not attempting to be the best creative music, film, blah, 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 as well as the best, like, accountant, as well as the best, like, chef or something like that. Like, mm-hmm. that's, you start spreading yourself really thin, but um, my interests do, they grow a lot. And that's why I lean more into the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial, mm-hmm. got it, uh, world, because people who are successful entrepreneurs, they're, what they're good at is ideas and making things happen mm-hmm. in that like broad scheme. And like maybe they know how to do some design work or some like manufacturing work or some yeah, like, production or marketing work, marketing work and all those mm-hmm. things but they're not the specialist in that but what they are they're really good at making sure all that stuff happens mm-hmm. you know what i mean and so you get to do you know you build an app and then you design a new bike and then you do a song and then you do a thing and these mm-hmm. people who sort of have that those creative minds and and i look up to a lot of people like that yeah and, and um, in the performing realm have you, has there ever been a, a ben kelly show of the solo act where it's you kind of uh, individually standing at the microphone with your name on it, doing no. your stuff. You're always an ensemble player, it sounds like. Yeah. To me, the best thing about playing bass was getting to be in a band. Yeah. Playing bass was fun. Joining my first band was amazing. Uh-huh. And so, like, that was the best, even though we were awful. <laughs> playing, jamming in a garage together, that was the... It, it was the most incredible feeling in the world. Yeah. Like, already, like, obtaining an instrument, like, oh my gosh. Yeah. And then, like, because my older brother had an electric guitar, and then I got a bass, and I was like, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. I was like, let's just do it together. And he's like, well, you don't know this. I was like, I don't care, I don't care. <laughs> I was like, I just want to hear them together. How, how old were you when you were playing in your garage? I was 14. 14. You know, and then when Your I was, brother's older? Yeah, he's two years older than me, and mm-hmm. he, uh, my brother's name is Alex, and he plays guitar in a heavy metal band mm-hmm. called Reaping Asmodea. Hmm. And they tour like crazy, and they're just fantastic hmm. they do so well and they it's super heavy super brutal music mm-hmm. and they have videos out and they have records out and they just i i couldn't be more proud of those guys and, wow. cool. and i grew up with that you mm-hmm. know i you had mentioned as an, uh, an entrepreneur and the the need for creativity but i think there's also that willingness to take a risk and say this could completely fall flat mm-hmm. but i'm gonna try it yeah and um what what kind of risks have you encountered and and do you feel like that's you have sort of a higher risk uh tolerance or threshold than maybe some of the other people you went to school with um maybe uh I th- it's an interesting thing I, I think about that stuff, but I haven't used the word risk too much. But you're right. You're absolutely right. There is a, a ton of risk in in trying to put on any of these things. And yes, I, I've risked a lot. I think just like, you know, as a producer, not as we're going back to the concept of like an artist, like I'm risking a ton of stuff and I'm asking the artists to risk their emotion or their, you know, so, you know risk giving away something deep or, or, or something like that. Like, that's potentially what a lot of people are risking or, like, uh, the, the fear of being embarrassed or any of those other things. Like, that's very risky as well. And as a producer, you have a lot of part of that or whatever. But I, I've i risked a lot financially. It's been a huge part. On mm-hmm. a lot of the... I've done a number of theater shows. I did a variety show, which was four episodes, and then I did a musical this past April. And so... Was that the one Matt was in? Um, yeah. He, he did I remember op- that he made an appearance at some sort yeah, of music. Yeah, he, he created a, an opening. Uh, he opened for my show with this whole act and this whole show of his own. Oh. A talk show. He created a character. and For somebody who hadn't done any sort of act or anything like that, he... I mean, as you know, he has a gift. Yeah. He has a gift in so many things. He, he, he already does amazing things, but he could do just a million more amazing things if, yeah. if people ask him. He's got... 
secret skills that secret are skills. untapped. He's one of those persons you just make sure you're, you're near him when it all goes down. <laughs> um, but for all those shows, um, they cost money. Yeah. They cost a ton of money. And you got to rent the space or reserve yep. the space. You got to rent whatever. the space. You got to pay people. You got to pay for supplies and things like that. Food and then insurance costs money and then everything. And those past two shows, I I had some help. I had some sponsors, mm-hmm. some like business sponsors. My folks have have helped or donated over mm-hmm. the years, of course. Mm-hmm. You know, but for the most part, I fronted all the money. Yeah. And that was one of the big reasons I moved back to my folks' place like two years ago. Mm-hmm. I had a great apartment and it was awesome. And mm-hmm. Living with, with a friend of mine. And then I had the show coming up and I was like, well, it's going to take all my time mm-hmm. and it's going to take all my money. And so I moved back to my folks' place and then I just, for a year, I spent all my money. Yep. You know, and, you know, I probably 16 grand yeah. out of pocket. Wow. And of course, some of it, some of the shows, you'd get all that back and then some with mm-hmm. ticket sales and some of them you wouldn't. Right. You know, but everyone had to get paid regardless. And, you know, and so I've, and I, I never consider it a gain or a loss, mm-hmm. but I've invested a lot of money into my own productions. For those people listening who are investing money and time and stuff, and once in a while, or maybe a lot of the time, you won't make back the money that you mm-hmm. spend. Um, but I have a theory that I've observed to be pretty much true in my career and that is every gig leads to another gig Mm -hmm. do you what do you think about that statement i i think that's i think that's so true Uh and gig being anything yeah and opportunity collaboration friendship oh uh, absolutely absolutely. phone call 10 years later yeah absolutely and the trick is uh nate babs actually and i had a great conversation about this recently but Good work leads to good opportunity. Yeah. That's gig leads to a gig. Yep. Whether it's really good work in a show or whatever leads to a weird record or weird tour. It's another thing like the system works, I believe. It's a very, mm. it's a very bohemian way to look at it. Like the system works and you'll never know the formula because it's so much deeper than any of this. Yeah. Like, wow. That's really interesting. You know, while, you know, you work really hard on someone's record and then you get a phone call to do a commercial 10 years later with a completely different person. It's like, who knows how many people that went through to get that opportunity. And then maybe it was just, you know, you, you give to the earth and the earth gives back. Like yeah. however you want to look at it. Right. But, but I, you know, you know, if you want to start talking about. Uh, higher power or things that are in charge of this sort of energy exchange mm-hmm. but I I love to think about it but then accept that I don't know how it works mm-hmm. and fully and I, I have complete faith in the system yep. of the industry of how friends work of opportunity mm-hmm. and I think that's that's different in some ways from when you were talking about you know being an accountant like if you're a, if you're a decent accountant and you're a decent human being Um, at work, you know, you, you keep getting promoted and there's very little risk there. Like you just keep doing good accounting and you'll just keep getting paid and you'll be secure. And, 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 and I don't know, that's, that's a, that's a, that's a great way for some people to live because that's what they love doing or they're good at doing it. But they're, you know, as far as the, the risk, like that's the element that's not in that kind of thing. Like they're, they're, the formula for them is really different than the, like there's the randomness. Of exactly. what you're describing there. Exactly. It is, it, is, it is a little bit more of a randomness. And, you know, in, in business worlds and things like that, it is a little bit more visual, the formula. Like, oh, you work your way up a corporate ladder or something like mm-hmm. that. And it's, like, you know, it's a great way. You know, for the... You, you work a little bit less on trying to win at the formula and you work more at your job and then you get compensated for it. But then you're also not perhaps getting rewarded the artistic lifestyle that we are. You know, there's always a trade-off. Mm-hmm. You know, and so for us, by risking everything on the randomness, we're potentially, you know, with risk comes, uh, you know, either a larger gain or a larger, larger gain or a larger loss. Mm-hmm. Per se, like if you could risk it all and lose it all, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, but if you win, it's like you're living this life where you get to do art and you get to work with people and collaborate and create and it's, you know, there's nothing better. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. And I... I use this the the gig leads to another gig formula as a uh, a healing balm, let's yeah. say, because if I'm uh, doing a show that you know I gave my all, but there's just nobody there. There's five people there, 
mm-hmm. or if I drove really, I drove hours and hours to play somewhere and it, nobody came or it didn't work out somehow. And it was, and it, it could be described in a clinical way as a complete failure. Mm-hmm. I always think to myself, I wonder why, I wonder what I'm going to get from this because I always get something. Mm-hmm. It's always like out of the five people who were there, I met one person who then joins my email list. And then six years later, they give me $1,000 to do an awesome gig. Yeah. Or they become a fan that's so loyal that they're going to buy every record I make for the next 10 years. Yeah. Or I got it on my drive home. I went to, uh, I discovered a restaurant in some town that, and I had so much fun in you know meeting a friend or or just driving or the the weather or i don't know what it was but it was like so gloriously great that the gig doesn't even matter because the moment was so worth it yeah. you know so and i think that i it always happens mm-hmm. even with the worst gig mm-hmm. and so and i've been in 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 the game or whatever long enough to know that it's true that it's you know something is going to bear fruit yeah that's that's exactly exactly that's a brilliant way to put it. Like it always bears fruit. And if you had some random seeds, you're like, I don't know what fruit this is gonna be and then twenty years later there's a tree and you got a pear. Yeah. It's like I didn't know I was planting pears, but it's like Yeah. You know, you waited and you were rewarded with the fruit. Yeah. A couple of guests ago we had this uh guy Shelgren Elkire on the show, which if you're listening to this episode you got to go back two or three and listen to the Shelgren episode because it's so good. And he's a professor of art at Manca- or at uh, Winona State University. Is that right? I, I think, think so. so. Yeah. And uh, but he was comparing being creative or being an artist to being a farmer. Mm. And you know, sometimes if you're a farmer in the Upper Midwest, you know, there's uh, years of drought, mm-hmm. and there's uh, years where you can't like the tractor's broken, and it's it's just. You know, and not just like, oh, we had a bad season. It could be we had a bad decade. Yeah. You know, yes. but he just talked about the like the faithfulness of the farmer to just keep planting and harvesting. And and I mean, that kind of just quiet, calm uh, faithfulness to the craft or to the mm-hmm. to the earth and to the growth is what makes you a farmer and what in the long run feeds the world, really, you know, yeah. and. And that's what we're doing. Absolutely. And it is just, there's something to be gained from anything. I, I truly, that, that exists whether you want to see it or not. Yeah. And then the other half of that is none of that works if you don't want to see it. If you want to chalk up a gig or an opportunity to, to this was terrible, this was junk, then that's what it will be. Yeah. It'll be, it'll be written that that's how it was. Yeah. Because you get to decide truthfully how things go and you're right you play for five people and it can be a bummer Uh but how you measure success or how you measure growth is internal and whether that's that's money time friendship solitude there's so many things yeah and it's it's the food you had it's the drive up there it's i've i've had some of the most important Re- revelations in my life on the worst gigs mm-hmm. and if I wasn't in that desperate spot mm-hmm. I wouldn't have reached that place Yeah, and this being taking all these risks and being in the creative realm of anything is lonely and it's scary as you guys know mm-hmm. it's, and it can get dark it can get real dark real quick if you're not careful and mm-hmm. even if you you know Cross all your T's and dot your I's. You can still get to that moment where it's just you in the room and nothing's going good. And you're like, woo. And you, it's like things aren't looking good. Mm-hmm. Like, and that's a bummer. Mm-hmm. But it's that farmer. That's such a brilliant thing to think about, which is you just keep farming. Because it's kind of like, I kind of think like, what else would I do? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm not going to turn around now. Yeah. Like, like, if I wanted to make, like, the, the responsible decision, like, I'm 10 years past that. Yeah. Like, it would be tragic to turn around, right. walk backwards for 10 more years, and then try to, like, pick up where I left off. And yeah. It's like, because what if that, what if right behind that next corner was actually the right, the right thing? And so, I, 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 I don't know who told me this. It's this incredible, I think it, it can apply to so many things, but it's this incredible saying, and it was a, 
somebody told me if you're in a war and you're in a valley between two mountains or two hills and you're about to be attacked but you don't know from where from which hill what do you do hmm. like what do you do like, what do you do oh I don't I've never thought about it I don't know if you're you're in the valley you're in the valley there's two, two hills hill, two hills and the uh, enemy on either side on yeah there's an enemy coming but you don't know from which hill uh, I don't I have no idea what's the answer y- the answer is pick a hill <laughs> I mean, what else can you do? Uh huh. You know, if you sit and wait, you're for sure dead. Yeah. In a scenario, you're for sure attacked and sure. you're done. Yeah. They have the high ground, you're done. Yep. So what you gotta do, it's a 50-50 chance. There's no way you can better either odds. Yeah. You pick a hill. Yeah. And you run. And if you get to the top and you realize that your face, you're right in front of the enemy that's gonna kill you, then you turn around and you go to the other hill. Because <laughs> that's yeah. all you can do. Yeah. Yeah. You just gotta... You gotta make a decision and you gotta go. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's so... That gives me a lot of peace, which is like... It part of me says some things are out of your reach. Yeah. And some things you just have to have faith that you picked the right hill. And yeah. having faith in the system, faith in... Uh, faith in people, faith in life. And yeah, all yeah, All that yeah. stuff. It just gets, it gets so deep and so heady and, and it's important. Yeah. Oh, man. Listeners, can you believe this? You're tuning in. This is... This is this is great stuff. Okay, so talking in this same topic, uh, I heard you say a couple times in our conversation so far, you're talking about sort of the, um, yeah, we're taking risks and we're making decisions about how we're living, but we're also, one of the perks we're gaining is, I, I wish I could remember how you phrased it, but you said something about this artistic life that is um, exciting and fun and Mm. And life giving and whatever. I can't remember the lingo you used. Like we'll have to listen back. But I totally think for me that's one of the hugest payoffs. Even though we're like the security is a little bit low and the stability is a little bit low and the income is a little bit low, but the perks of just getting to do cool stuff, that's a huge perk. Yeah. You get to you get to go to cool places with cool people and do highly unusual, extremely fun. Uh, and extremely like euphoric, you get to be open to euphoria mm-hmm. more than I would guess someone with with a more regular job. And I'm not, I don't ever want to diss anybody who has a regular job because you know everybody's vocation is valuable and legitimate. And course, and if you're course. yeah, so we all you know what I'm talking about. But boy, it there is something to be said for being in show business. The why, why do people want to do it? It's because it's incredibly fun. Mm-hmm. And even saying this now, I feel embarrassed. And I feel like I should watch my tongue. Because I can hear somebody saying, I can't believe how stuck up these people on this podcast are. Or I can't believe yeah. what yep. an egomaniac this guy is by saying how great it is to be a musician. But... I'm sorry. It's great. It, it, it's great for the people who can do it. And someone who is amazing at working a job in a company or something like that might want the concept and the reward of being a musician, but they don't enjoy the struggle. And so the reason people like us love this lifestyle is because we also love the struggle. Yeah. And... And the and then there's the grunt work of it, the, which I like. Yeah, and that's the thing. Like I, I have, I don't mind sending emails ten hours a day. Yeah, I don't even mind it at all. And mm-hmm. I don't mind driving all night long. I don't mind sleeping on floors. I think all of it's fun. Mm-hmm. You know, and I don't even mind sacrificing time that I could spend writing songs in order to hustle. Mm-hmm. Like I'll do the hustle. I don't mind. Yep. And that's just who I am. And so the whole package to me. Feels like, uh, like I'm getting away with something. Like this is really fun, right? It and it is, and it's because, I mean, the reason we can say it's so good being a musician is because we're not just saying it's just so fun getting the rewards of being a musician. Yes, it's, it's that whole thing, and it's, it, the, it's, it's the it's the work itself. It's the work itself. That's its, its own reward, and vice versa. Somebody, we keep going back to the idea of an accountant or something like that. Yeah. You know, they might not like 
the grunt work of that. And we job. we love you, accountants. Seriously, well, because <laughs> we because, love we all love you. You know you. You know, he might, he or she might not like the grunt work that they're doing, but in exchange, they're basically getting way more money. Yeah. Complete stability. Yes. Regularity in their life and in their family. Yeah, they they have a boat. They have a boat. And like they have a nine to five and they know they can see their family after five. They go to Europe. They go to Europe. Stay in a nice hotel. And it's like, and you, and you can plan on that for 10 years and still get that. Yeah. Potentially. And, and so they're. You know, for the work they put in. Yeah. And that stuff sounds pretty sweet to me. That, like, I would love to have that, but I, I, I'm not designed that way. I couldn't do it. I yeah. mean, I could, if I had to, if the world was going to end unless I did it, I would do it. Yeah. But, but, you know, and like, I... What world are you imagining here, Ben? Man, it's, it's a crazy world. It's very generous of you. But, if, you know, if, I, if there's one person left and it's In me, a world. And I got to do accounting, like... Where I'm, it will end. I'm game. I'm, I'm moving Ben Kelly does accounting. But it's some sort of twisted Wachowski Brothers movie. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I think about this, that um, this goes to anybody, like, if you... You don't have to. You don't have to necessarily love the grunt work of what you do. If you love what it is giving you, if if maybe it sucks to lay brick, but if you love the job that you have and the compensation you get and what a lifestyle you get around it, right. then that's amazing. Yeah. And if you don't love either end of that, then you should do something else. Yeah. You know, and I. It is. It's tough to talk. Uh, I I recently heard a podcast and it was a. Uh, oh gosh, who was it? Uh, it was a, a famous actor, and he's like, you know what's hard? He's like, this, oh, it was Kevin Bacon, and he's like, it was on, on The Nerdist, which is like my favorite. Yeah, podcast. I like those. Uh, Ner- just, that whole network has good shows. Yeah, it's just a really great show. And, and I think they were talking about how, you know, he can ne- it's so rare that he can actually like gripe about his job because everyone's like, well, you have an amazing. And he's like, well, I do. He's like, I know I have an amazing, but I still, there's hard parts of this job. Yeah. And I have to wait until I can have dinner with like Leonardo DiCaprio so we can both gripe about the same right. thing. Right. You because know? to hear those guys complain, people would get furious. Like, how dare you? You're a and, zillionaire. How and, dare you complain about a director or getting up early or being away from your family? Like, gra- you know. You know, grass is always greener. Yes. And you think, and I, I used to, I used to talk to my dad. I'd be like, dad. What did you want to do when you grew up? And he's, he's like, you know, when you're a kid, you have dreams. Like, I want to be an astronaut or whatever, mm-hmm. you know? And I'm like, why didn't you want to be like an actor or an artist or like in a band or anything like that? Because he loves music and he, my folks have been so supportive. I have a twin sister and an older brother and they're both in the arts. And so they just love it all. I'm like, mm-hmm. why did you want to do anything like this? Because in my mind, so ignorantly when I'm 18, like my dad, my dad's worked at the same job for 30 odd years, mm-hmm. you know, putting in windows. And, and I'm like, why did you want that? And he, and. You know, he's not nearly as poetic as I put it, but he's basically like, he's like, because you want that stuff, but not as bad as you want your fulfillment. Yeah. And his fulfillment was a wife and kids yeah. and a house mm-hmm. and a family. Mm-hmm. And he's like, I don't care how much crappy work I have to do at whatever job. He's like, I've created a family. He's like, that's way better than if I would have chased some dream. Right. And it's like, it's... The complete opposite for me, and so that's why I'm like, man, it is. I'm so glad you did that mm-hmm. to allow me to be able to do this. Like, if yeah. you wouldn't have made this family, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Do you ever have waves of embarrassment inside of you when you want to celebrate the the joy you have in playing or producing, and you find yourself second guessing uh, the language you use or the you're ex- expressing yourself because of who might hear you constantly. Constantly. Really? Oh, because I that happens to me a lot. Constantly, and I, I tell me about that. Like, what? Give me an example. I mean, um, oh man, I played <laughs> or a location. I played. I played this show, and I we got off the sh- off the the show, and we were the group I was playing with. We had a later set, and there was a ton of people there. Uh huh. Ton of people there. There was a bunch of bands, like a festival all day. Ton of people there, and. We got off the stage and it was just, woo, and you're just totally jacked up. Yeah. And I was off stage. I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And there's other people like, wow, great set, great set. And I was like, man, it's just crazy. There were so many people out there. I was getting like dizzy trying to look at all the people. Uh-huh. And he was like, yeah, we didn't have that problem. And he was in the first band and there was like no one there. Did he say it because he was seriously kind of mad? No, no. I mean, he was, or was another, just sort of joking he's, around. He sort of joking around. But, but still, like, there was it, truth behind there it. There was truth behind it, yeah. And, I, and I mean, Did you feel bad? Of course I felt bad because 
you would never want to just do something that would make someone feel bad. Nobody wants that. Nobody, yeah. But but you weren't trying. No, of course not. You were not. just and you were in the moment. You know, he you were being you were in the moment for where you were at. Exactly. And the the truth is the truth is everybody says dumb stuff and everybody talks loose lip in their life. Yeah. And I hear people do it all the time as well and you're like, "Man, that's a little, you know, and you if you say something offensive or whatever and and because the truth is our brains are all firing neurons at different speeds and we're saying stuff and like even in this podcast if I ever listen back I might be like god why did I say that <laughs> yeah whatever but like you know we're, we're everyone's making mistakes yeah. and I think I think yes that happens whether you said the right thing or not I've said the wrong thing a lot of times and you just learn from it you're like oh that was dumb like yeah. with past girlfriends or whatever and you say something you're like oh like that was so stupid <laughs> but like I didn't know I've never had to say that any other way before right and you just never know yeah and I think the I think people just need to have more grace when people say dumb stuff yeah sometimes and I think there needs to I think. Uh, if you're, let's say you're listening to this show and you have a friend who's an artist, who, musician, performer, whatever, writer, if you want to do something for that friend that would be really, really a great friend move, you could call your friend and say, anytime you love your life, anytime you get a great review, anytime you sell out a show, anytime you're just high as a kite because your art is so fulfilling, call me and tell me all about it. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to listen and I'm going to hear you yeah. and accept your yeah. joy. And, and not change the subject. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, right. <laughs> because holy cow, if you did that to your artistic friend and you gave them permission to l- let it all out, that would be a wonderful thing. Like I got polluted in my own story. Probably, uh, let me think about this, maybe... Eight, seven, eight years into my career. I'm celebrating my 25th anniversary in showbiz right now. So oh. this is kind of a momentous... Congratulations. Like, yeah, it's kind of a momentous year. But as I was kind of getting the ball rolling, I went to a dinner party with a group of friends. And I had just... I don't even remember what it was, but I had just come off of a, a whole series of really successful shows. Mm-hmm. And I remember which record I was supporting at the time. And, and it was really going great. And I think I'd been on a tour... And so I came home and Dawn was there and we went to this dinner party thing with people and I was just feeling great yeah. because I had, I was living the dream, you know, and I was in the company of friends that I felt really yeah. comfortable. Yes. Like I, I could just be myself, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I said something about, I can't believe how great this tour, I just, the tour was so great and I was expressing my joy and one of my friends who was there said, Jonathan, you, can you shut up? A lot of us hate to get up in the morning, you know. We hate to get up in the morning because we have to go to some job that we hate. So I don't need to hear you going on and on about how yeah. great. And this person just told me to my face. They just, in front of everyone, just sort of took me out. And I felt horrible. Yeah. I felt so horrible. And ever since that day... Now I'm second guessing. Mm-hmm. Now, thankfully, I'm married to Dawn, who really knows me and mm-hmm. who, I can, who I can be myself with. So if I have a moment of triumph or even a moment of horror, I can be totally open and, and be heard and understood. But, but gosh, you want your friends to... It's got to be more than just your partner, you know? Absolutely. And, I mean, that, re- that whole situation is so much deeper than what people do for a living. It's... If someone's not happy, the last thing they want is someone who's happy. Yeah. And then going deeper than that, if someone is like actively doing something, like if someone's really following their dreams. Yeah, and taking risks and putting it on the line. You people really become cynical to that. They do. But then also... Or they feel threatened because they think, man, I, I haven't put anything on the line. Also, on the other side, who knows, you know... The reason we have been able to do this and we can be happy about it and we can express our joy about it is because on top of our ability to work and put through, we have had all the luck and the advantages in the world Yeah, that we can still do this. Which or was, we've had um, supportive networks supportive, everything. who have helped us financially or emotionally when we've been Absolutely. had our butts kicked. And so 
a lot of people don't have any of that. Right. And like they would love to be in the same boat and they have all the same work ethic. But sure. Nobody can do this alone. And some of them are more talented sure, than course. the people who make it. And so I don't know. You know, I get in the situation too. And of course you need to be able to bite your tongue when you need to. And you need to be humble and damp that line between – being respectful and humble and accepting of yours and other people's position in life yeah. before becoming too entitled or, or elitism. Let's ex- yeah, let's explore the other side then. What can we learn about humility? And, um, and like for me, like the, the huge thing that I always try to do is the, the count your blessings thing. Mm-hmm. Because when, if I do have a bad gig or if I have a period of time that where I don't have any momentum or if I'm, you know if I have a creative block or something or I'm, or I'm feeling kind of dissed, it's so easy to get down and think like, oh gosh, I'm, you know, I'm not very popular and not, nobody cares about my work and nobody knows who I am and I can't get anybody to call me back and I can't get any shows. And you, it's easy to get sucked into the downward spiral. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I always have to step back and almost take an inventory of my life and look and uh, get a big picture view and realize, wow, even in these moments where I'm feeling really like, uh, well, like my momentum is gone, I have to be thankful for what I do have and what I have been able to do. And so, and those, because certainly there are moments of joy and celebration in the arts, but there's also a lot of struggle, you know. So I, I try to remember the good stuff in those moments of bad mm-hmm. stuff. It, it's, it's completely that. And it's, it's sort of embracing the realism that everything you have could go away in a second with one tragic move. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. A hurricane could take your house away, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And ha- sort of really, like, not only beyond, beyond knowing that, but accepting that is terrifying, but liberating. Like, well, then does it really matter? If it could go, if it's that fragile, it could one thing could swipe it all out, then... Does all this stuff really matter? <laughs> right. And maybe it doesn't matter to whoever else, and it matters to us. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, in this dinner situation where you're, you're speaking so, like, oh, this is amazing. On the flip side, what if there was, like, an accountant who just, like, he's like, man, I make so much money. It's crazy. <laughs> like, it's so, like, it's like, as soon as I think I've made enough, it's like, boom, I make more money. It's just, <laughs> I'm so successful. Uh-huh. This past quarter was insane. Yeah. I got a boat and then I bought another boat. <laughs> you'd be like, you'd be like, dude, shut up. <laughs> like, I'm a struggling artist. Like, I work my tail off. Like, some mornings I don't want to wake up. Like, uh-huh. you'd be in the exact same position. Yeah. But I think maybe because we're artists, we're more apt to just express ourselves yeah, or whatever. And maybe. That. And maybe that's the only difference between you and dude at the thing is, you know, he, he probably makes 20 times the month what you make or uh-huh. whatever. Yeah. And like, who knows? And, but he's just, you know, in his mind, it's the grass is always greener. He's thinking like, right. you're just living this lavish life and no one knows about those, you know, where, you know, you're sitting in your bedroom crying because you're like, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. You know? And it's like, <laughs> yeah. that's a, that is a hard thing to get over. Yeah. You know? And... Those dark times where you're like, well, you can never be like, well, at least I have my money. It's like, at least I have my family. It's like, as artists, sometimes like, at least I'm not dead yet. <laughs> and it's like, woo, it's like really like when you're counting your blessings, like sometimes it's tough. You're like, well, what am I counting here? I'm just counting sheep, man. Yeah. Like, that's, and that's how I feel. Yeah. You know, and nobody knows about that. And so then I feel like when you're an artist, you're so used to everything just sucking all the time uh-huh. because that's what it is <laughs> nine years of the time everything sucks and it's the worst because uh-huh. because you, why would you have anything that's good i remember i i with my, my girlfriend we had this conversation and and she was having a rough day and and we were talking about it and she was just like why and i was like you know why because you don't like nobody deserves anything good ever because that's why like <laughs> they're like nothing's supposed to be fair yeah. like when has that been the rule right and, like, yeah because yeah this is in kindergarten right like because everything sucks and then when you want when you need it to get better it just gets worse and because whatever because uh-huh. i don't know why because <laughs> that's really the reason and it's like whew, it's like that's terrible but everyone's dealing with the same crap yeah essentially yeah and, yeah you know, and you all, we all got to wake up each day. Yeah, you that's know, right. You know, whether you're, make, you're playing the guitar or making some rich guy a bunch more money. Yeah, yeah. Or whatever. We all got to wake up. Yeah. And we all got 
you know, we all got problems. Yeah. And, and, you know, and I feel for people who, you know, have a harder time with theirs than I do. Yeah. My problems are nothing compared to what other people have. Right. Vice versa, you know, but then there's a lot of people that have way less problems than me, probably. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And. Well, I think the takeaway here for anybody listening is, and I think about this a lot and it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's a comfort. It's that grass is always greener thing. Yeah. And boy, that's a, that's wisdom to hang your hat on. Exactly. And it's, it's my, you know, you're in between the two hills and it's like, man, if that's the hill that we're not getting attacked on, we'd get away so quick and we'd have all the time in the world and we'd have extra time yeah, and, and we'd have and tanks. So we have tanks and we could come back <laughs> and it's all this stuff. And it's like, yeah, but, and then if you pick the wrong one, man, if we would have just picked the other one, it's like, yeah, but you didn't know. Right. You don't know. Nobody right. knows. It's like, y'all, you're all just, you're all just randomly just shooting guns just like I <laughs> hopefully I'll hit something Take a hill. oh here's something that I think about a lot in arts and I've been thinking about it just in my personal life but I've never said on the podcast but like I have career fantasies that are opposite of show business because I've never had another job mm-hmm. this is the only job I've ever had so and then the the career fantasies that I have are like concrete measurement kind of career like like my big one is like law enforcement or like, I want to be a cop, or like an FBI agent, or something. <laughs> Don's just like, oh, because in Don's life, <laughs> because that's like the, I don't have because I don't have any skills or any or any temperament for that kind of work. But I like I'm so drawn to like being a cop because I think like when you're a cop, like you drive in your car, like you 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 catch the bad guy, you protect, uh, you get the kitten down from the tree, you you know, right. you help the. Or like to be, I think about like I could be an EMT, like drive an ambulance, because the the payoff. Don's just cracking up <laughs> because the the payoff would be so concrete. You'd be like, oh my gosh, there's the car wreck. That guy's got a broken leg. I'm gonna I'm gonna help him, and I'm gonna bandage the leg and get him on the stretcher, get him in the van, drive him to the hospital. I mean, it's so concrete and it's so immediate. Like like the job satisfaction is completely measurable in the moment right there. Well, and to me, that just feels like, wow, that would feel so rewarding instead of the work that we're doing, which has no payoff unless you see it like years, years later. The, the songs bandage the heart. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, and isn't that, isn't that how it goes? Somebody who lives a life in complete unstructured randomness, you know, daydreams about a job where, he doesn't have to worry about that, you know, and like with all the same reward and gain, yeah. things like that, and all those things are taken care of. You know, it's the same thing. Uh, it's, it's a dark analogy, but uh, a guy in prison looking out his bar windows at a homeless guy, and like, man, I'd give anything to that guy. He's free. He's free. And the homeless guy's like, man, I'd give anything for three square meals. Or to be and warm a, and a place to sleep. Yeah. You know, and it's like, <laughs> you know, and it's, uh, you know, and I, I do the same thing. I was like, man, I, I know these people like these design companies or whatever and they, man they have a dope office and they go in there and then they create these things and then they just go home and yeah man and they're making boat. tons of money and their boats and like <laughs> sounds awesome <laughs> sounds awesome and that's why it's super fun to dream and that's what they are they're dreams yeah because yeah. because if it's really something I wanted to do then I should do it there's nothing really stopping me from doing it yeah and a lot of people are like man I could totally do that and you're like well just do it and like no nah, <laughs> nah, nah, which is fine it's like we don't have to do it but like don't pretend you're gonna do it or like but it's okay to dream about it you know I totally dream about you know anything you see you see and I, I think that's so great because that we can still have like a fascination for like by no means is what we do on the top like people like think like man the people that are on the top of like the job market are these actors and people in these large touring bands you know that's the top like everyone's just shooting for that and it's like no it's like it's all equal. It's all. It takes every job in the world to make stuff happen. Yeah, you know. And yeah, there's it's there's a uh, a brilliant uh, Quincy Jones in his autobiography. He talks about, and I, I might get some of the the facts here wrong, but what happened at some point in the middle of his life, he ran out of money, hmm. whether investing in projects or things didn't do well. Whatever. He kind of just like ran out of money and needed a job, and so without a skip of a beat, he. He, he picked up a job like laying brick or like concrete. Wow. Yeah. Like Quincy Jones. Like doing like construction work. Wow. And no job ego or any of that stuff. Just people like didn't shoot. He's like, yeah, but now I need to do this. Yeah. And 
you know, only for a while, but like, mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit around and not do anything. He's like, um, you know, in that concept of like, a man works. Yeah. It doesn't matter what you do and, you know, you show up every day and you're employed to do a job and you do that. And yeah. talking back to my old teacher who's like, I'm not an artist, I'm an employee of music yeah. in a way. Mm -hmm. And he did that until he got back on his feet or whatever and then mm -hmm. he jumped back in the studio and, yeah. you know, did Thriller or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I don't know if he actually, I can't remember all those people did what record. But yeah, like, he, he did, did do it. Thriller. Yeah. yeah, and so so it's just, you know, like, no, like, man, I had to do this weird gig last, last you know, a couple years ago, but forget about it. You know, it's like, no, man, like, if they didn't make roads, what would I drive on? And yeah. if I didn't make music, what would they listen to? Yeah. You know, and, and I, and so my take on that is what I do every year except this year because my, it just didn't work out this year, but I work at the state fair. Oh. Mm hmm And I do sanitation. Okay. And so what that means is all the garbages. Uh-huh. All the cardboard and the compost and the recyclables. Yeah. All the bathrooms. Uh-huh. All the, just the poop, the pee. Yeah. Everyone pukes all day uh -huh. at the fair. All day. <laughs> yeah. All that stuff. If there's like people get hurt and bloody noses, all that stuff. Everything awful and gross. Uh -huh. The reason why a place can stay open is because like sanitation. Someone's doing that job. Yeah. And it's a whole team. And I've done it every year for the past four years. Wow. And you work. I mean, normally we're doing 17, 18 hour shifts. Wow. 12 days in a row. Yeah. It's insane. <laughs> but for only 12 days, it's just the busiest place in the world. Yeah. It seems like, you know, and there's constant garbage bathrooms are constantly getting used and overflowed and there's it just everything and yeah. there's a whole team it's a 24 hour team that runs oh, yeah. and you go there and you wear shorts and a blue shirt everyone wears the same blue shirt Yeah. and ain't nobody care that I make music yeah. or that I put out records or that I tour or yeah. nobody cares about that stuff this dude plays football this yeah. guy is an accountant whatever Yeah. yeah. doesn't matter because we're all here to clean up someone's puke Yeah. because if we don't the fair doesn't work Yeah. and then it's not Enjoyable yeah. for the people that are here. So it doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, Our job. You were like preventing cholera. Yeah, right. It's like, <laughs> what do we, you know, people have no idea. But it, it's like you walk around. I walk around the fair. I see people I, I know all the time, but yeah. nobody recognizes me because I'm covered in garbage yeah. some of the time. Yeah. And I mean, yeah, I get paid for it, but it's like minimum wage yeah. at first or yeah, not much. Uh -huh. um, and it's where a lot of like, a lot of like ex cons can get the job, or people who are, yeah. you know, go, going through hard times, and it's like a rehabilitation program. Well, sure, the job for people. It's like an opportunity for people that don't get a lot of work. And, yeah, and so you're working with people from all walks of life, mm -hmm. and you know they don't care who does what. It's like someone puked. If you're cl if you're nearest to it, yeah, that's you your gotta game. clean yep. it up. Yeah, and then as soon as you get back, you gotta do this and you gotta do this and. You know, you show up at 6 a.m. and if you're late, you're fired. Like, I'm sorry. It's just like this whole operation runs on everybody doing the same job. And it's the most humbling experience. And, you know, it's the only manual labor I do all year. And it's, you know, 100 degrees out, mm -hmm. 300,000 people in a day mm -hmm. on some of those days. And there's too many people, so you can't drive trucks or bins yeah. through the fair. So you literally got to take as much garbage as you can hold. Yeah. And you got to run across the fairgrounds. Wow. You're sweating. It's dripping down your back. Oh. But because it's overflowing, you got to get it out. Yeah. You got to get it out. And you can't, you know, they hold the magic of the fair to the highest regard of everybody. Yeah. You know, like people can't know. And it's one of on. the best fairs in the, in the U.S., yep. if not the world. Yep. And it's the, incredible. And the team that runs like the sanitation department and everything and how the fair works and the whole, all the structures, it's so amazing. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, the, you know, a guy who's you know, 50 years older than me to like someone who's 20 years or you know, only 20 years old or something like that. Mm -hmm. They're all working just as hard as me. And, yeah. And sometimes I'm on the cart with this guy or the other guy and then they're like, this thing happened. They need help over up on this area or... This thing broke down. You got to go, and it's and it's never ending. It is a twenty four hour cycle of constant repairs and yeah. and things like that. And wow. and so I do that, and I'm exhausted afterwards. Mm -hmm. And then I get to go make music for the rest of the year, <laughs> or write a script or something like that. And it's yeah. like, man, you know, it, it's been the, that like humbling experience where it's like, man. Well, it's a it's a perspective oh, generator, yeah, absolutely, and do a reality you, check. Do you get creative inspiration as well? Like, have you had songs or shows or you know characterizations? Does it does it does it prove fruitful? Sure. In that way? Well, it can be very meditative. Yeah. So you have a lot of. I mean, you have all day to just think. 
about whatever. Yeah. Basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That sounds like kind of satisfying though. It to, is. Because it's so measurable. It is. And that's, and I think that's why I love doing it. My yeah. twin sister's done it longer than I have. Yeah. And she's incredible. Yeah. And she's the one that got me into it. Yeah. And it is like, be, you know, if I did it all year round, it's not for me. No. But once a year for yeah. 12 days, yeah. it's rewarding. Yeah. 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 Well, tell, I know you've, you've got lots of irons in the fire. You're making albums for listening. You're playing on traveling tours with bands and artists. You're in theaters doing productions. Can you tell our listeners, like, if they really know you now? You know, we've just spent a lot of time hearing about yeah. you. I feel like we really know you. So where can we see you in action and hear your music and go to watch you perform? Like what's coming up in the next six months? Well, I play with a lot of great artists. Um, some of the main folks right now is uh, John Mark Nelson is releasing his uh, fourth record on, yeah. in, in September. And so we've worked really hard on that record. And are you, you're in the touring band and are you also in the studio band? Yes. Yeah. I've been with John since basically the beginning when he first started getting bands and yeah. playing. And so that's happening. And then there's going to be a bunch of great shows and tours. Hopefully that'll follow that. And are you also in a production or engineering role in that group? Are you? Uh, no, no. Okay. Like Matt does that. And yeah. then we've had different producers. On is the, John the Mark's new album at the library as well? Like his yeah, last the few? library. And then he brought in uh, Jake Hansen, who's the guitarist who plays, you know, mm. with so many Halloween Alaska and all these other amazing groups. And mm. so he produced a lot of the vision on this record and which was incredible to work with him. And, okay. And so I played bass with him. Um, I helped, I co-produced Rachel Roberts' self-titled EP. She's a, she does country music. Hmm. And her and I have been dear friends for a long time. And so oh, is that? And Nate plays drums with her at yep. the Dakota. Yep. Yeah, yep. yeah. Yep. Okay. Nate plays I don't know her music, but I've seen him talk about that. Yeah, and so she's done an incredible job the past few years writing these tunes, and we've been putting these things together. That's happening, uh, and I'm playing with, um, yeah, whoever I can to... Are there lots of other sort of one-offs here and there yeah, and just sure. random collaborations? When it happens with the, the right kind of people, the mm-hmm. people I'm really excited about. Um, Do you have a bands or m- multiple projects where it's your vision and you're the leader and coordinator? And um, Not often where I'm playing bass. Okay. Um, I'm just the, the team player a lot yep. of times on bass. I'm producing a record coming up um, by a, a friend of mine named Brian Lenz, and he... Uh, he just writes great songs he produces theater as well he's helped me with a ton of my shows and he wrote all these songs and I was like let's put this out Mm -hmm. and And which studio space do you record so the big that's going to be in this new studio space which is another iron in the fire which is a thing called Good Arts Collective and basically the quick spiel of this is there was a lot of unused space that once belonged to a youth program inside of a church, First mm-hmm. Covenant Church in downtown Minneapolis. Oh, yeah. did a was there for a session once. Yeah. And so it was all this space, and the, the guy who sort of does all the music there. and Bruce. Bruce. Yeah. Bruce Belgard, which, for all the listeners, if you don't know him... He's make, a great musician. Make sure that he's your best friend for the rest of your life. <laughs> because your life will be better because of it. Yeah. And... Thanks to Bruce and his connection there and the incredible team and the staff and the congregation at this church, they sort of allowed me to take ownership of all this space. Oh, yeah. Those upstairs rooms and that's a cool building with lots of space. And so they they weren't too nice as far as like they weren't kept up and a lot of weird storage stuff went in there. And so this summer, I basically uh, was slowly getting more and more help, cleaned out all these rooms. Nice. And created what's called the Good Arts Collective. Wow. Which... Now what we do is we provide studio and office space for our artists, which are members. Mm-hmm. And you're a member and you're, you know, by paying some and then agreeing to these missions, we're going to, this is what we're, our missions are, is help yourself, which is grow your own art in your career. Mm-hmm. This is use the space, use the resources to do what you need to do, you mm-hmm. know, to further your own art. And then help each other, mm-hmm. which is true idea of a collective, which is... Here, come play on my record, help yeah. me sew this costume, help me paint this picture, whatever it may be. Like, yep. We're all there to help each other. Just yep. true collective. Number three is help the church, which First Covenants is giving us a immeasurably amazing opportunity to be in this space and yeah. to do what we want to do. And mm-hmm. so whatever we can do to give back. Sure, like if they need music for something, if they need art for music something. Music for something and art. And even yeah. like, you know, they, they hold, the amazing thing about them is they hold so much value with just bringing energy into the building and mm-hmm. new people in life and 
whether it's it's money or events or volunteering or cleaning projects or yeah. anything, and that's what we're figuring out right now. Yeah. And then the fourth mission is helping everybody else, which we're going to put some programming together and hopefully maybe some creative workshops. So we're talking about a movie night, and we can just try and create some things to l- let other people. And we're not going to you know put programming together twenty four hours a day and every night of the week, you know, but some things that we really believe in that we could have some friends and mm-hmm. larger communities in. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I'm doing. I'm, I created that with Bruce and with the team here, mm-hmm. and uh, I'm sort of the managing director of that. And so one of the rooms we're building a recording studio. Oh, cool! And uh, you know, Nate is a part of that as well as like Matt is going to help us get some of that stuff figured out. And mm-hmm. with a lot of Jake Armding, who you mentioned, he's a part of the collective as well. Oh, great! And so there's this amazing room that's for it. And so right now we're just you know putting up the wall treatment and figuring out the room. And hmm. you know, and so September 1st we're going to start recording on this record I'm producing on. And so hmm. the Good Arts Collective Recording Studio. There might be a cool name one mm-hmm. day, but right now it's the Good Arts Collective Recording Studio. Cool. And how about theater productions? Do you have any of those in the hopper? Um, no. Uh, I've essentially had an on, like, like production deadline for the past two years with my past two shows and just a lot of work. And so I'm really excited to not have all that right now. Yeah. I, my last show I did was called Chewing Marbles, and we did that at the Bed and Lower Town in St. Paul, and that went really well. Mm-hmm. And so I've looked into a couple of the theaters about remounting that and doing it again. We'll see. Mm-hmm. As well as my show last year was a variety show called Bear in the Barrel, which we did four episodes of that at a theater. And uh, Are these preserved on video or on YouTube or anything? Not yet. There's okay. pieces of them, little pieces of them. I have all the raw footage right now. Yeah. Whenever I'm ready to go through it. Mm-hmm. Other people can see it. Um, I really want to continue that. I have a lot of ideas for that. The variety show and making a more series out of it. But I'm also really, right now I'm really interested in, in screenwriting. Oh, wow. Yeah. Have you done that before? Very little. Yeah. Very little. Like nothing even like, very little. (laughs) But I know a lot of people who do that. And it's just sort of, it's what interests me right now. Mm -hmm. It's the next way, it's it's a vessel in which to tell stories. And it's something that I I think I'm going to go for. Mm -hmm. And we'll see. Mm -hmm. You know? Maybe six months from now I hate it. Or Mm -hmm. maybe I move to Los Angeles and I do that full time. Mm -hmm. But... I love movies, I love television shows, mm-hmm. I love stories, I love characters. So that's, that's where my brain is right now. Wow. I'm also, I also just very recently started sewing. Oh, cool. And I, I sewed my own shirt. I have a um, Husqvarna sewing machine fantasy. Like I'm going to go on Craigslist and buy one and then just start sewing clothing yep. for myself. Yep. I even have a song about it where I fantasize about becoming a fashion designer. Yep. Hmm. Great. I mean, you could. Yeah, I, told, I totally could. Totally cool. I love the bobbin. Yeah. That's my favorite part of the machine. The bobbin, yeah. And the take-up the take up lever. And the button holder. The, yeah, I love that stuff. Uh, and so basically, my, my mom is a fantastic <laughs> quilter, and she has a whole sewing room at the house. And I was like, Mom, I want to sew. Mm-hmm. I've gotten super into like like American-made men's clothing and all these companies that are making things by hand. And yeah. I buy all those clothes, and I'm just super obsessed with it. And I was like, I want to make my own shirt. And so I did. I bought some fabric and a pattern. Cool. And it took me ten and a half hours. Uh huh. And I made one shirt. Yeah. And it was amazing. It was so a lot it of work. turned out the way you wanted it. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, it fits and it looks like a shirt. I mean, there's all kinds of weird, yeah. imperfect spots in it, but from scratch to creating it and like with my size and I measured it myself and yeah, it's, a, it's like a men's formal button up shirt. Yeah. And like the collar was insane and the cuffs were insane. It's just this stuff. But now I'm like, yeah. Yeah. And now <laughs> I'm good. ready to do it. And it is. It's just, it's exciting to me right now. And it's, you know, it's flexing a different part of my brain. Yeah. And, you know, I've talked, I know some other people that make clothes and it's just, it's really interesting. There's something about sewing and fabrics that's really, that's really got me tickled right now. Yeah, that's awesome. Wow. That's so really I don't cool. Know, I don't know what it'll turn into. Yeah, I'm hoping to start a clothing line someday. But yeah. You know, maybe my show takes off or whatever. So it's kind of, you know, I'm doing a ton of things and I'm kind of doing nothing. Well, one of my favorite songwriters is Sam Phillips. And she did, uh, well, I don't know if she does this all the time, but I remember she did a particular tour that we saw years ago where she had so designed and sewn all of the clothes that she wore on the tour. Yeah. And then the album she supported had uh, like uh, clothing tags and stuff as the 
recurring theme of the album art. Right. And it was really cool. So, That's and so then cool. I remember talking to her at the show, and she was wearing a dress that she had designed at on the tour. So it's it's a that's a a cool precedent well, and, and it's totally like I know friends that are fantastic musicians and then they're just incredible cooks or chefs yeah you know like well, how do you know how to do any of this stuff I'm like I don't know just like I yeah. have a passion for it and I guess I'm good at it and, yeah. you know and then they're also on the flip side just the most incredible like drummer or something I know yeah well creative people have some t- oftentimes multiple genres that they're good at yep yeah. Well, how can people track you down? Um, are you a social media person? I just followed you on Twitter, so I know you're out there on Twitter. I but have Twitter. Do you have a preference of like, because hundreds of people are going to hear this and they're going to think you're cool and want to find out what you're doing. So I, tell them how to reach you. I think all you guys are cool. Uh, and, I and I can't wait to meet you all uh, <laughs> one by one, two hours each. I got the time. Yes. No, I, I honestly, I'm not amazing about all of the social medias, but I am, I, I do Facebook. Yeah. Well, and you are searchable online, but you've got so many irons in the fire that you the search for you turns up like yeah. a bunch of weird, random, different yep. things. Yep. Basically my name, I go by my full name since there are so many people that share my name and it's just Benjamin James Kelly. Mm-hmm. And I try to make everything searchable by that, mm-hmm. but I'm on Facebook under that. Um, Twitter, I think it's Ben James Kelly, mm-hmm. but my favorite is Instagram. Oh because, yeah. Instagram. Oh, cool. because I love Pretending I'm a professional photographer with these filters and making taking photos, but my, on Instagram my name is uh, Benjamin James Kelly. I'm looking at it right now. I'm okay, I'm going to find you right now. And it's um, Kelly K E L L Y. Yes, not E Y. Correct. That's another version of Kelly. Correct. Yeah, so. there's a lot of there's a lot of people copping my vibe out there. Yeah. My name, everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, but Instagram, I'd say I keep most current on Instagram. Okay. And then I I I'm, I post those things you know on my Facebook and Twitter and things like that, but. Follow me, I'll follow you back. I love looking at cool pictures. That's why I love Instagram so much. And it's not filled with a bunch of advertising yet. But when it does, we'll, we'll get the new thing, I guess. Yeah. Benjamin James yeah. Kelly, hold on. So on Instagram, it's, it's the dude with the, with the big mustache. Yep. I have a big mustache in the picture. All right. Sunglasses on. Yep, I got you. I just followed you. Great. All right. What would you tell your kindergarten self? Mm-hmm. I would say, hey, Ben, go home and give your mom a big hug and a kiss because she's awesome. That's Ben Kelly. Thanks for being here. Good night. Creativity.